Patrick Von Rau, orthopedic surgeon from the Brisbane Hip Clinic. This video is on activity recommendations for people with osteoarthritis of the hip joint. So this is a really common discussion that I'd have with a lot of my um, people who come to see me who have um, various grades of osteoarthritis all the way through from mild disease all the way through to uh, more advanced disease uh, and the principles um, uh, remain fairly similar for um, all people within the group with some modifications depending on individual circumstances. So um, the considerations for activity recommendations um, really come down to um, two main points. The first is um, the risk of progression of wearing of the joint as a result of the activity. Um, and the second consideration is with respect to the overall global management of the person's symptoms. So the primary um, concern that a lot of people would um, voice to me about their participation in sporting pursuits and their active lifestyles, um, if they've got uh, osteoarthritis at the hip, is, um, is it causing them harm to participate? Um, that is, um, is their activity something that will meaningfully contribute to um, the development or the acceleration of wear within their joint? So the answer to this is that um, Hip osteoarthritis um, is complex and the um, causes in the majority of cases are um, not easily definable. Um, so there are many, many factors that are involved in the development of osteoarthritis at the hip joint and um, we quite frankly don't understand them all. Um, what we do know is that there are quite a large number of factors that are indeed completely out of your control. Um, an example of that might, for instance, be um, genetics, where we know that there are some family lineages which have uh, more durable cartilage than others. Um, and in um, uh, some family groups, the development of osteoarthritis in relatively earlier ages is um, a little bit more common. Um, and that's a factor that you can't, that you can't influence. Um, so we would see, for instance, lots of um, older aged people who have been very, very active throughout their entire lives and are continuing to run reasonably, you know, medium to large volumes and in fact don't have osteoarthritis in their joints. Um, by the same token, we might see younger folk who have um, relatively more sedentary lifestyles and, and develop osteoarthritis in early age. Um, so clearly, um, activity volume um, is not often a contributory cause um, that's clearly associated with the development of osteoarthritis for most activities. Now, um, there are probably a few caveats on that, where there are some very specific sporting pursuits that have been identified at putting person at higher risk. Um, and so in those people who are engaging in those sorts of sports, then maybe we might have to have a bit of a discussion about, um, about how to modify their activities um, in such a way as to reduce their uh, osteoarthritic um, uh, risk over their, over their sporting career. But in the vast majority of cases, uh, for the majority of the sporting pursuits that people are engaging in, uh, including impact pursuits like running um, and tennis and squash and um, skiing and um, cycling, those sorts of things are, um, are not really clearly um, linked to development of osteoarthritis. And, um, and so if your concern was um, whether or not participating in those pursuits is going to lead you to harm, the answer in the vast majority of cases is no. The other um, discussion point uh, that I have with people relating to activity in osteoarthritis is um, in relation to the management of their symptoms. So certainly activity modification is a really important factor uh, in the overall global management of somebody's osteoarthritic hip. So um, for instance, there would be uh, many people who would find that there might be a given pursuit, let's say, um, medium distance running, which might exacerbate their symptoms significantly such that um, they're not really enjoying it anymore. But if they pull back from that particular activity, 
um, and engage in a different pursuit, then they're getting um, much better symptom control. So activity modification is um, the, probably the best term that needs to be used here rather than activity restriction because it's not necessary to eliminate activity as a whole. Um, indeed, that's very detrimental for other reasons um, because we know that sport and physical pursuits are, are important for a person's overall general health in so many other ways that um, unless we've got a really good reason to stop people doing um, sporting pursuits and, and, and maintaining active lifestyles um, that's evidence-based, then we really we should be um, trying to avoid those sorts of recommendations where, where, where possible. So, um, so activity modification is probably the best way of describing what we would recommend, um, where we might talk about, for instance, alternative activity selection that might be more um, friendly to your condition um, where you can participate with um, resulting less symptoms. Um, alternatively, you might indeed be able to also re-engage in those activities which you have been doing which have exacerbated symptoms. Um, um, an example of, uh, but there might be some sort of um, change or, um, uh, or some sort of therapy that could be applied that might make your participation um, more feasible. An example of that might, for instance, be cycling, where someone who's poorly fitted to a bicycle um, might be putting their hip into certain motion ranges that are exacerbating their symptoms and causes them um, not to accelerate their wear, but to um, exacerbate their pain. And so they aren't really enjoying cycling anymore because of that. But, um, but with um, some changes in their bike posture, for instance, that would be more accommodating to, um, to their hip joint, then indeed we can often see that people can get on to uh, um, cycling activities with relative comfort, even in the uh, cases of advanced osteoarthritic wear. Um, indeed, cycling is one of those activities which I would generally call fairly hip friendly. Um, and tolerated really well by people with osteoarthritic joints. Um, yet um, there would be some people who come into a knee initially and say, well, listen, I can't do that activity because it's too painful. And indeed, um, there are some strategies that you could investigate or, or explore that may mean that you can then continue to participate in that, in that activity um, with much more comfort. The, the central point that I do want to highlight though is that if you perform an activity and you experience symptoms, um, that's not necessarily indicative that your, your underlying condition has been made worse. So flaring of symptoms um, due to activity is indeed just that, right? It's just flaring of your underlying condition. Um, the underlying condition can remain static. It's not necessarily... Um, the pain is not necessarily an indicator that you've caused accelerated harm. Now, common sense applies here for most people. If you're doing an activity and it hurts, um, then maybe you would consider some form of activity modification or adjustment. But that's not done from a, a perspective of trying to preserve the joint. That's done more on the perspective of trying to find strategies um, and a blended, sensible way of being able to manage your underlying condition for years to come. When we talk about the non-operative management of hip osteoarthritis, we generally talk about a blended approach using strategies such as activity modification, physical therapies, um, and exercise prescription, together with some form of um, long-acting injectable therapy, uh, for instance, visco supplementation, and the intermittent use of oral pharmaceutical preparations on an as-required basis. If you want to maintain um, maybe fairly modest activity levels, um, and you're happy to give away certain pursuits that you're not particularly invested in, um, that might be causing you symptoms, then you might adopt uh, the approach of of doing alternative activities and exercise pursuits um, to minimize your symptoms. And then indeed you probably might not need to take any tablets or have any injections and, and your symptoms might be pretty well controlled. By the same token, there are 
a lot of people who um, have come to me who are saying, well, listen, this, these symptoms are now starting to become a little bit more intrusive. And um, I really don't want to give up these activities because um, although they cause me symptoms, they're what I would associate with what I would equate to um, quality of life. And um, I, I derive enjoyment out of them and I would like to continue participating. But I'd like to be able to look at some strategies to be able to reduce my symptoms during during participation and afterwards. Um, and that's, particular, that's completely fine too. What we have to accept though is that if we are going to continue in certain exercises and certain physical pursuits um, that are likely to result in some sort of irritation of symptoms, then it probably means that you do have to accept that you're going to need some... Um, uh, uh, probably a little bit more treatment than than other people might. And so um, that's where you might be a little bit more proactive with the use of your tablets, um, skillfully using them on an intermittent basis, but probably a little bit more frequently than those people who are adopting a more sedentary lifestyle. So indeed, um, how much activity you participate in is really dependent on how many sim how much symptoms you're, you're, you're willing to experience um, and indeed, um, how willing you are to um, to adopt some of the other treatment strategies in our armamentarium. And obviously, the more treatment strategies that you engage in, the better your symptoms will be, and probably the more active you can, the more active you can be in those physical pursuits. A lot of the discussion that I have with people about activity patterns and sporting pursuits in the presence of osteoarthritis of the hip relate to um, what they should avoid. Um, I think equally um, it's worthwhile thinking about not so much um, just the activities that you should avoid, but also the activities that you should be doing. So um, there are a lot of people who have um, associated muscular um, um, disorders uh, as a result of long-term adaption um, and habit and posture um, as a result of them having hip osteoarthritis. And uh, for, so, for example, we would very commonly see um, in association with osteoarthritic wear of the hip joint, people who also have bursitis or tendonitis around the hip joint. Um, and there are a number of therapies that can be delivered to people for those um, for those conditions which predominantly relate to exercise prescription. And so, um, so it's useful to think not only about what you should maybe modify or avoid to be able to get best symptom relief, but also about what sort of things you can actively do to be able to improve your, um, your condition. Um, and so in a lot of cases, we would be um, recommending, um, particularly if people have a, a significant burden of um, uh, symptoms related to some of these uh, associated conditions, we would recommend that they might see um, a, a physiotherapist or, or exercise physiologist for assistance in terms of exercise prescription um, and um, conditioning programs. So I hope that you found this video on activity for people with uh, hip osteoarthritis useful. If you want to read more around the topic, um, there's a lot of information on our website at brisbanehipclinic.com.au. Have a great day.